I wonder what have been some of the defining moments of your life. Uh, naturally, I'm quite a shy person, but for some reason, when I was about 12, I decided to enter a public speaking competition at my school, and I did quite well. And I think for me, that was a bit of a defining moment. It meant that although I was quite shy, I knew I could do public speaking like this. Or I think of another time when I was about 17, I was a pretty good trumpeter, uh, and I was good enough to qualify for the BBC Young Musician of the Year competition. And so I was feeling good about myself, and I went up to London for the audition, and uh, I did abysmally. And uh, the judges slated me. And I think that was quite a defining moment for me. I knew that music wasn't going to be my career at that point. What about you? What have been some of the defining moments of your lives? For some, it'll be an event that has happened to you. Whether a, a tragic event like a, a parent leaving or dying when you were quite young. Or maybe a good event, like being born into a really privileged family, so you were able to, to get a really good education. For some of you, the defining moment of your life might be around a choice that you have made. Maybe, again, for good or bad, maybe you chose to marry someone against the advice of people around you, and it turned out they were right. Or you chose to come to this country. For some of you, the defining moment of your life will be around something that you've done. You've, you've had the perseverance and the determination to train for and run a marathon. Or you got the sack because you just weren't reliable enough at work. What are the defining moments of your life? And in this talk, it's part of a series where we're looking at how different biblical characters have found God to be strong in their weakness. And we're looking at the story of Simon Peter, and there were so many defining moments in his life as a friend and follower of Jesus. You know, there was that frustrating day when, as a professional fisherman, he'd caught no fish at all. And then Jesus showed up, and all of a sudden, they had a boat full of fish. And that was the day that Peter decided to start following Jesus and to leave his fishing business behind. That was a defining moment for him. Or the defining moment when he tried to trust Jesus by walking on the water. And he managed to take a few steps. <clears throat> but then he started sinking. But it was a great day still. A defining moment of his life. Or the day when the penny dropped for him about who Jesus really is. And he said to him, uh, you're the Messiah, the Son of God. And Jesus replied to him. Uh, he gave him a new name. He, he called him Peter for the first time, saying he was the rock on which he would build his church. Wow, what a day that must have felt like to Peter. And yet just a few minutes later, when Peter had had the temerity to say to Jesus that Jesus was getting his plans all wrong, Peter then uh, Jesus then turned to Peter and called him Satan. That must have stung. Or, of course, there was the night that Jesus was arrested. Peter had sworn blind that he was ready to even to die for Jesus. And as if to prove his point, he cut off the ear of one of the soldiers coming to arrest Jesus. So there was Peter, full of bravado. But then just a few hours later, as he was standing by the fire, and a servant girl says to him, you know Jesus, don't you? And he said, I've never heard of the man. All the bravado had evaporated. And so some real defining moments in Peter's life, some awesome achievements in there, some incredible insights, and some fantastic failures in there as well. And yet by the time Peter wrote this letter, decades later, he was a legendary leader throughout the churches that existed by then. And so here's an encouragement we can pick out from this, uh, Peter's up and down journey of following Jesus uh, and we all have these ups and downs in our journeys of following Jesus. And the encouragement is this, that failure doesn't define you. Failure doesn't define you. So in one of the defining moments of Peter's life, he failed spectacularly. He sold out on his closest friends not once but three times at the very moment when his closest friend needed him most. That was the utmost fail. That moment would have haunted him. But in God's kingdom, failure does not define you. And some of you will be haunted by moments of failure. Failure at school or academically. Failure at work or failure socially. 
failure as a child or as a spouse or as a parent. And for some of you, that failure will feel so sort of overriding to you that it impacts on all of you and you feel your whole self to be a failure. As if you're no good and there's no hope of you ever getting better. And so would you hear this? In God's kingdom, failure does not define you. So do you remember what happened to Peter? You know, a little while after Jesus' resurrection, he goes for that walk along the beach with Jesus. And Jesus asks him, do you love me? And Peter replies, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus asked again and then again, as if to point out that that Peter had denied him three times. Now, have you ever thought, why did Jesus ask that question? Because as Peter pointed out, Jesus knew all things. So Jesus knew that Peter loved him. So why did Jesus ask the question? I think it's because Jesus knew that Peter needed to hear himself say that he loved Jesus. Peter needed to know that, yes, underneath all his failures, underneath there was still love for Jesus. And so do you see what's happening here? Jesus was healing Peter's pain of failure by addressing his moment of failure and by giving him new work to do and by helping him articulate his love for Jesus. And so, friends, if you are haunted by a moment of failure, would you take encouragement from this story of Simon Peter? Don't whatever, you know, whatever failure you've had, don't let that define you because in God's kingdom, it's not the end of the story. Would you let God take you back to that moment of pain and begin to bring his healing there? Would you have the courage to have that conversation with Jesus, however difficult it may be? Don't let failure define you. And then here's another encouragement from the story of Simon Peter. Faults don't disqualify you. You see, Peter had some pretty huge character faults, didn't he? He's the lovable rogue of the gospel stories. His words and actions, he's always sort of boldly going where no person should ever even timidly go. He was impetuous, he was rash, he he didn't think before he spoke. But Peter's character faults didn't disqualify him. You see, when Jesus chose his 12 disciples, he knew that Judas was going to betray him, and he knew that Peter would deny him. He knew that Peter would put his foot in his mouth more times than he cared to remember. And still, he chose him. And when Peter and Jesus had that walk along the beach, Jesus didn't say to him, look, I hope you don't mind, but I've decided to make Andrew the rock on which I'm going to build the church instead, because you're a little bit too, well, you know, sort of shifting sandish. You're not really rock material, are you? No, Jesus didn't say that to him, because in God's kingdom, character faults don't disqualify you. One writer says this, When Jesus chose us to be his followers, he knew our future failures and faults as surely as he knew Peter's. We may be surprised by our own depravity, but Jesus isn't. We may be tempted to say, oh, that's not the real me, but it is. Facing and admitting our failures and faults is one way Jesus teaches us what the gospel is. Our failures and faults show us what we really are, great sinners. But that's not what Jesus wants us to focus on. He wants us to look to the cross and allow our failures and faults to show us what Jesus is, a great saviour. So I don't know what your character faults might be. Doubtless some of you know all too well what some of my character faults are. But whether we're battling with anger or with speaking before we think, or with lust, or with spending more money than we've got to spend, or whatever the issues we've got, remember that Jesus knew all about those before he chose you, and he still chose you. Faults don't disqualify you in God's kingdom. 
You see, Jesus, when he calls us to follow him, he sees our future potential. He calls us to live up to that. So he called Peter the rock, even when he was such shifting sand sort of material, because he knew that over time he would be transformed. And he was giving Peter something to aim for. And by the time Peter wrote this letter, he'd become wise enough to to think before he spoke. And he'd learned to put his trust in Jesus uh, in sticky situations rather than relying on his own strength in those sticky situations. And he'd proved himself to be a rock-like pastor who could lead his people through great difficulties as well. So when Jesus calls you and me to follow him, he knows our character faults, but he sees the future potential and he calls us to work towards that future potential. Some of you, I know, are doing the well-being journey course at the moment. And it talks about having a growth mindset, not a fixed mindset. In other words, it's all too easy to look at our character faults and think they're so deeply ingrained in us that there's no hope of change. But Peter's life is proof that change is possible. And he encourages us, therefore, to pursue this growth mindset. Listen to what he wrote. Is this going to come on the screen? Thank you. Make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. And I picture that as a wonderful ladder of character development. It starts with faith in Jesus at the bottom, because as Peter wrote in verse 3, it's his divine power which has given us everything we need for a godly life. And if we try to change our character by our own effort, we will never get there. But if we change it by faith in Jesus, then this sort of transformation is possible. Jesus has given us everything we need for a godly life. And and, uh, through faith. And so we can begin to add in goodness, that is, copying Jesus, the one who is truly good. We can add in knowledge, not just a head knowledge of God, but an ever deepening heart knowledge of God, which gives us wisdom to live as He wants us to. We can add in self control, the sort of self control that Peter didn't have years previously when he fell asleep in the Garden of Gethsemane, but did have now. And perseverance to endure the storms of life rather than sinking under them. And godliness, that reverent awe for God and his plans and purposes. And mutual affection, a better translation might be brotherly and sisterly love for one another. No matter what our differences of age or culture or background or politics or musical tastes or or whatever it is. And then love, sacrificial love crowns the list. The sort of distinctly Christian love that Jesus demonstrated for Peter when he died for him. And the sort of sacrificial love that Peter would soon demonstrate for Jesus when Peter was martyred. And Peter says this, if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And you see, if we haven't got this growth mindset, climbing the ladder, if we're just on a fixed mindset, then it says we're going to be ineffective and unproductive for Jesus. I don't know about you, but I find that sobering. That I could be unproductive, ineffective for Jesus. I could be like the seed in Jesus' parable who fell among the thorns. And Jesus started growing up, but then the thorns choked it. And Jesus explained, the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. So friends, if Jesus has been so good to us that he's given us everything we need to live a godly life, we don't want to be unfruitful and ineffective and unproductive for Jesus. So says Peter, make every effort to climb this character ladder. You know, we try to get better at school, we try to get better in our jobs, we try to get better at parenting, we try to get better in the gym, we try to get better at looking after the environment. Let's try every effort to get better in this character ladder, letting Jesus transform us. So like Peter, 
Don't let failure define you, but allow God to heal you at your point of painful memory. And don't let your faults disqualify you, but allow God to transform your character so that you can be fruitful and effective and productive for him. Now, just to help us sort of reflect on this and on Peter's life, uh, we've got some questions uh, which are going to come on the screen. And if you're watching online, you might just want to sort of press pause and give yourself a few minutes to think through these questions. Or if you're here in the building, you might want to read those and pick out one or two questions. And uh, we're going to watch a video which is just going to help us give a bit of time and space to reflect on this together. And then I'll pray for us. So let's watch this video.